right, take your Bibles, turn with me please to the book of Mark, chapter number 11, Gospel of Mark, chapter number 11. We'll pick back up tonight with our series on prayer problems. We have looked for the last, I think this is part four of a series that we've been doing on Wednesday nights, dealing with prayer problems. And I said this several times, I'll say it probably every time I preach in this series, and that is, I used to think the biggest problem with people People's prayer life was they just didn't pray. But then I realized there are reasons why people don't pray that make it difficult for them to have a desire to pray or to have the prayer life that they should have. And so I really felt impressed to the Lord to just kind of take a couple of steps back and look at some things that might be in our life that's hindering us from even having a prayer life. We could say, well, you just need to go pray. Your problem is you don't pray. But what we're learning in this series is that there are certain things in our life that if we pray and we don't deal with these problems, we're not gonna get our prayers answered anyways. So we're taking a few steps backward and we're looking at several passages of scripture that deal with prayer problems. Our first message was um, a message entitled, Why is it so difficult to pray? And we dealt with the fact that prayer is spiritual warfare on your knees. Real prayer, true prayer. It's more than just getting down reading some names off of a list or going through the motions and calling out things and hitting hot spots and and, and, and fulfilling your quote unquote duty or obligation as a Christian. If you're really praying, and I mean you're praying in the Holy Ghost like Jude says, you're entering into spiritual warfare. The devil and the demons of hell are gonna fight you and it's gonna make it difficult if you're not aware of the seriousness of it and 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 you're entering into it with a warfare mentality. If you're half cocked, if you're just if you're just flippant, if you're going through the motions, it's just a routine for you. You're, you're, you're going to have a lousy prayer life, and the devil's going to kick you up the road like a tin can. So we dealt with the fact that it's difficult to pray because it is a spiritual warfare issue, and the devil hates praying Christians. He's scared of praying Christians. He's powerless against a praying Christian. So he's gonna do everything he can to fight you. He'll make it where you're so busy you don't have time. He'll make it where you're so laden down with the burdens and cares of this world that you just never get around to it. If he can keep you from praying, keep you off your knees, he's won the battle. So we dealt with that in the first message. The second message was entitled, No Need to Doubt Him Now. And we dealt with the fact that if you pray without believing, pray without faith, and it's a waste of time. The Bible says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Let him ask in faith, believing, not wavering. He that wavereth is like a sea driven with the wind and tossed, James says. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. You can go and pray, and you can pray for three hours, but if you don't believe God can hear your prayer and that God's going to answer your prayer, you don't believe that God's capable of answering your prayer, you're wasting your time. It's an insult to God to pray without faith. And we dealt with the fact that the first prayer God answered for you was the prayer of salvation. Can I get witness? The first prayer God answered was your cry for salvation and you weren't even his child yet. And he changed your eternal destiny from hell to heaven. Why is it we don't trust him with everything else? That's the biggest, that's the biggest prayer God will ever answer for you. Can I, can, 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 can y'all agree with me? The biggest prayer God will ever, ever answer that you prayed was the prayer of salvation. I don't care if you're praying for your mama's got cancer or for your daddy lost his job or one of your kids is sick. If you prayed and asked him to save you and he changed your eternal destiny from hell to heaven and he gave you eternal life, that's the greatest prayer God will ever answer and you weren't even his child when you prayed it. You became his child. Now you're his child, he's your father. And we go to him in prayer and he said for us to enter boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And yet we go in wringing our hands and we act like he can't do what we need him and are asking him to do. And we talked about one of the big prayer problems, the reason why people don't pray is because they just don't believe God can. 
Now, if you don't believe God can, that's going to be a huge deterrent. If I, get, if I told you, I said, I need you to run up the ATM machine right quick. I need to borrow some cash. I'll pay you back Sunday, but I need $500 and I need it right now. And you've only got $15 in your bank account. You're not going to be too excited about going up and putting your debit card in that ATM machine. Because you know it's a waste of time before you ever get there. That's how a lot of people enter in their prayer closet. We talked about that. Last week we talked about having a bad connection. You got a cell phone, you can't get a connection? Huh? It's breaking up. We talked about being down there at the gift shop at the Shady Maple, and you're underground, and you got all these toys, and you got all these beautiful pieces of furniture, and all these quilts, and you're all looking at them, and you're looking down, and you don't have a signal. You can't get a text, you can't send a text, can't call, can't get a call, and the only way you can use your phone is you gotta leave the gift shop, and you gotta go stand outside by the door where there's a signal. You can't talk on your phone and look at all the pretty stuff at the same time. You gotta make a decision. I was just there Monday, I know. Brother Chad Watson called me and I had to go sit over there up against the wall under the window to have a conversation because about 15 feet in, it was breaking up. And you can't, you can't play around in the devil's gift shop and you can't look at all the pretty stuff and have a prayer life. You're gonna have a bad connection. You're gonna have to choose either looking at all the pretty stuff the devil has to offer or you're gonna have to have a communication line with God, which means you're gonna have to enter into that prayer closet with a clear line of communication, unconfessed sin, making sure you're right with God. Don't have time to repeat all that. That was last week. Tonight, we're gonna look at another prayer problem, failing to forgive. Failure to forgive out of Mark chapter number 11. Are you there? I'll let you remain seated if you'll listen. Verse 20, in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. What's he talking about? Well, back in verse number 12, on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. To Jesus was, and seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily he might find any, uh, anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. I got a message on that. Looks good, but ain't nothing there. For the time of figs that was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, the fig tree, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And then the disciples heard it. Verse 20, and in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remembrance saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. Oh, look here, Jesus. That prayer where you prayed, God heard it. <laughs> what do you know? Woohoo! Jesus looked at the fig tree and said, no more. And, and the next day, it was withered up and the disciples were like, wow, that worked. Wow, that worked. Look at what Jesus said. Verse 22, underline this in your Bible. Well, this will preach for about a month. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast of the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Write this down, number one. We see the scope of our potential. The scope of our potential. Prayer moves the heart, that moves the hand, that moves the world. Prayer is an, is, an, is an unlimited resource at the disposal of the believer. Jesus said, you're so surprised that I spoke to that tree and you come back today and it's all withered up. He said, I'm telling you right now, if you have faith, you can say to that mountain, be cast to the sea and it'll happen. And I've heard preachers debate on whether he's talking about a literal mountain or a figurative mountain. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. One is just as easy for God as the other. Is he talking about that mountain chain over there? Are you saying, preacher, that I can pray and believe and God will pick that mountain up and throw it in the middle of the ocean? Well, he's got the power to. But I think we're pretty okay with where the mountain is. We've got a few mountains in our life that we really need him to move. And we just don't think he can. We just don't think he can. We think that mountain's always been there and that's how it's always gonna be. 
Why is it so difficult for us to do what Jesus said in verse 22? Have faith in God. That whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt. I underlined all the references to faith, by the way. There's at least four. Verse 22, have faith in God. Verse 23, shall not doubt. Verse 23, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Verse 24, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Faith in God's imperative Amen. for us to be able to tap into the unlimited resources that are at our disposal. I'm talking about big things like, Lord, would you please change me? Not would you change my husband. You can pray that. That might not really be the problem. Lord, change my wife. Make her a better wife to me. Won't you pray and ask God to change you? Who knows, when he gets done changing you, you might like her like she is. How's that for an eye? How's that for an answered prayer? God might give you just exactly what you needed if you just get with the program. Lord, change my pastor. Well, you can pray that all you want to. <laughs> change my church. Change my pastor. Save our city. 65,000 people in Dundalk, Maryland. Go over into Essex, another 45,000 in Essex. 400,000 people in a seven mile radius of this church. Why don't we ask God to move that mountain? I'm gonna tell you why we don't, because we don't believe he can. Oh, ain't nobody gonna get saved. That's your problem. I know I've told this somewhere before, I may have told it here, about a young preacher who was complaining to an old preacher. He said, man, I ain't had nobody saved at my church in three weeks. That old man said, do you really expect somebody to get saved every week at your church? He said, no. He said, well, that's your problem. <laughs> the scope of our potential. But here's what I want you to notice. Number two, we see the setback to our prayers. Look at what he says in verse 25. And when you stand praying... Forgive. If you have ought against any that your Father, which also is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Newsflash, lack of forgiveness is a prayer problem. There are two scenarios as I was studying this afternoon, and by the way, this was the hardest day of my life to try to study. I came in here this morning, there was about six or seven guys in here, and I said, man, if y'all are all, all y'all's here, I'm gonna go study. I'm not gonna sit over here and run this motor saw all day. They said, preacher, we got this, go, we got this. And I said, make sure you do that and that and that and keep an eye on that right there. And I walked down to my office and I studied about 15 minutes and I got up and come back in here. And I did that all day. I've been working on this message since seven o'clock this morning, off and on. But I noticed something as I was studying today. I noticed something about forgiveness. I noticed something that I don't think I'd ever seen quite like God showed it to me this morning and throughout the day. There are two scenarios that you and I are gonna have to confront when it comes to the area of forgiveness. Are you ready? One is in our text, Mark eleven twenty five, And when you pray, when you stand praying, forgive if, here's what I've got marked, if ye have ought against any. I think everybody in here knows what that means. Anything. If there's anything that you have in your heart against another brother or sister, anything. It ain't gotta be big. It usually never is big. In fact, rarely is it big. Rarely is it big. That's why Jesus used that analogy 
He said, you've got the telephone pole in your eye and you're worried about the toothpick in your brother's eye. It's usually always something really little and silly that robs us of our, our joy, robs us of our song, drives wedges between best friends and husbands and wives and family members. But the first scenario is if you have ought in your heart against any. You think, man, I can't believe she said that to me. I can't believe he did that to me. I can't believe they treated me that way. I can't believe they didn't invite me to that birthday party. I can't believe they didn't invite my kids to that birthday party. My kids always go to their birthday party. And their little two-year-old had a birthday party. They didn't invite my little... Come to church on Sunday and sit here and grieve the Holy Ghost all day long over some stupid birthday party invitation. World dying and going to hell without God. We need revival in America. Place is going to the toilet and, and, and the whole place is going down the tube and we're sitting over here bickering over stupid stuff. Newsflash, you can't get a prayer through if, you, if you're carrying that around in your heart. You can't. So the first part of that scenario is if you have fault against any. I'm also going to tell you something else some of y'all ain't going to like when I'm going to tell you. You don't have to agree for there not to be ought. We don't have to agree on everything for me to not have ought against my heart. I mean, if you want to be wrong, that's your prerogative. <laughs> but I don't have to be bitter at you and unforgiving and have an attitude and that become a thing right. in my heart. We don't have to see eye to eye on everything. I don't even agree with myself on everything. I'm, you think I'm kidding, I'm not kidding. I've even gone back through some of my books and re-edited them and changed a few things because I'm not exactly sure that the way I said it 10 years ago is the best way to say it. I don't even, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with myself all the time. Me and my wife is about as compatible as any husband and wife could be, but we don't agree on everything. We just choose not to focus on that stupid stuff. And if you let things get between you and God and it hinders your prayer life, you're the one that's losing. Because bitterness is drinking poison hoping somebody else will die from it. You know how crazy it is to carry around all in your heart towards somebody and most of the time they don't even know it. They don't even know it and it's become a thing, and it's in your heart, then the reason why I really, I'm not getting too specific tonight, because I believe the Holy Spirit of God can do a whole lot better job nailing down in your heart and in my heart what he's talking about here. You start throwing out a whole bunch of scenarios and hypotheticals, you say, well, I ain't guilty of none of those. Yeah, but you're guilty of a half a dozen other. Well, let the Holy Ghost finish preaching that point. It's amazing how touchy people are. Touchy, wishy-washy. You need to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Be spiritual. And I mean, I'm talking about with one another. I'm talking about with each other. I'm talking about with brothers and sisters. I'm talking about with your, your, your church family. I'm talking about the people of God. It's amazing how silly and petty people get. People get mad and leave churches over the craziest things. I can see leaving a church over a doctrinal issue. I can see leaving a church over moral problems or money problems, but leaving a church because they changed the color of the paint on the wall without your vote? Are you serious? You're laughing, but it's common. I was in the hospital. The pastor didn't even come see me. Well, first of all, you didn't even tell him he was in the hospital. So there ain't even need for a second of all. That's far enough. It's amazing. People get so worked up over things. But if you can't pray, and I can't pray if we have alt against any. So that's the first scenario, is if you have alt against somebody else. But then it gets even better. Save your place in Mark. Go over to Matthew 5 real quick. I want to show you something. Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number five. You gotta see this, you need to underline this in your Bible. 
Matthew chapter number five. Look at verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. Y'all following me now? The first scenario is when you've got ought in your heart against somebody else. This scenario is when you go to bring your gift to the altar and all of a sudden you remember that somebody else has got ought in their heart against you. Am I still in the book? Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, verse 23, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. God said, this is Jesus talking. Jesus said, if you go to bring your gift to the altar and all of a sudden you remember that somebody's got alt or somebody's offended with you, said you just leave your gift right there. Don't even move forward. Don't pass go. Go straight to that person. Get it reconciled. Get it worked out. Get it fixed. Then come back and finish doing what you started. So, here's what the Lord helped me with today. Burden of proof. The burden of proof, it's a legal term, burden of proof. Who's, who's got the burden to get the problem fixed? Whoever wants to get a prayer through first is who I'd say. Well, I'm fine with them, but they're not fine with me. If you go to pray and you remember that, and God brings that to your remembrance, because that's one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit, Bring all things to your remembrance what he has said. And this is something he said right here. Amen. And you go to pray and all of a sudden God brings that person to you. You might as well just quit right there. Yeah. Just put a pen in that prayer. Pick up the phone. Say, I was just getting down to pray. And I was thinking about you. I'm going to pray for you. But when I thought about you, I thought maybe I've done something to hurt you. See, that's where I just lost about half of you because that ain't really how you wanted to go that conversation to go. You wanted to go something like this. I got down to pray and I thought about your ugly mug and I realized you got a problem with me, you sorry sap sucker. No, you say, I got down to pray and the Holy Spirit of God laid you on my heart and I'm calling you because I'm, I'm afraid that maybe I've done something to offend you or I've done something maybe to hurt you. And man, I don't even want to finish praying till I make sure we're okay. Are we okay? Is there anything we need to fix? And then shut up and listen. And don't interrupt. If they say, oh, no, we're fine. Are, we, are you sure? Because I got down to pray for you. Lord laid you on my heart. I just want to make sure it'd kill me to think that I've said or done anything to offend you. I just want to make sure that we're good. I don't want to do anything to grieve the Holy Spirit at church on Sunday. Are we okay? Just make sure. You know, that's polite. Just double check. You know, you're sitting at the table, they bring the check and they lay it on the, on, the, on the table and you say, I got this. And they say, oh no, I got this. You say, no, I got this. They say, okay. <laughs> that was supposed to happen like two more times and then. <laughs> Are we okay? Yeah. Okay, good. No, if you think there's a problem, make sure there's not a problem. Why? I don't know, maybe you need to get a prayer through. This is what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said. So the two scenarios are if ye have fault against any, and the other scenario in Matthew 5 is if thy brother hath ought against thee. If the Lord brings it to your remembrance. I circle that word remembrance. I circle that word remembrance. And if thou bringest thy gift to the altar and there rememberest. You already knew about it. And God brought it back to your mind. He brought it back to your mind. Why? Because he wants to make sure your heart's right with everybody else. Now, I'm not saying everybody's got to be bosom buddies. We're talking about forgiveness here. 
I'm not saying that you got to invite them over to your house every Friday night and hang out and play games and put puzzles together. That's probably not realistic with some people, but you can have a clear line without auditing your heart towards them. There's a lot of people that I disagree with on a lot of things, but it ain't hindering my prayer life. And I'm talking about stuff that's big, but it ain't gonna hinder my prayer life. I'm just, they gotta do their thing, I'm gonna do mine. It's not gonna get, it's not gonna get me in the flesh and rob me of my ability to pray. As a pastor, I have to do that with every single one of y'all. And as a church member, you better learn to do that with me. Well, I just can't listen to him. He said this, well, you really wanna go there? Do you really want to sit down and get the scorecard out and go down that road? I can't sit under him no more. He said this, okay, when you get done talking about the stuff about that I said that you don't like, then it's going to be my turn. But I don't really want to play that game. I'd rather be able to get a prayer through. Amen. Is everybody still with me? See the setbacks to our prayer, the scope of our potential. Well, we can ask God to move mountains. Believe God can but he said, before you pray, you need to make sure you deal with this. Thirdly, write this down. We see the solution to the problem. This is deep now. I need everybody to get, wake up. I need everybody to get your pencils out and your pad. This is going to be deep right here. This is going to be a crash course, Bible college crash course. I got to get my Bible open. This is Mark 11. It's fixing to get real up in here. The solution to the problem. You ready? Forgive. Did you get that? Some of y'all ain't writing. That was the whole lecture right there. Look at what he says. Verse number 25, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have all against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you. Verse 20, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you. So what's the solution to the problem? What's the, how do you fix this prayer problem of not being able to get a prayer answered because you've got all in your heart against other people? Here's the solution. Just forgive them. That's it. But, 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 we, but, I, but we need to talk. Just forgive them. We need to work some things out. You know what? Just forgive them. You know, in Job chapter number 42, Job's three friends, I choose the term loosely, <laughs> his three friends, the Bible called them his friends, so we're going to call them friends, but man, with friends like that, who needs enemies, right? For 40 chapters, they raked that man over the coals. You got what you come, had coming to you, Job. You think you're all that and a bag of chips? God wouldn't be letting this happen to you, Job, if you didn't deserve it. We love you and we're your friend and all, but you need to just confront the fact, Job, that you're not as spiritual as you think you are and God's got your number and you got it coming to you. 40 chapters. Wax and eloquent. Somewhere in there, I just kind of picture Job rolling his eyes. Lord, help me. Are you kidding me? What a bunch of lousy comforters you are, he said. You think you're so smart. You think wisdom died with you. Some of the stuff Job said to him, I'm like, hey, man, brother, I know how you feel. Gets down to the end of the book. He humbles himself before God. God says, okay, Job, here's the ultimate test of how serious you are. I want you to pray for your friends. He told those guys, he said, I want you to go to Job. I want you to apologize and take some sacrifices and Job's gonna pray for you. That would have been the average, the average Baptist church member. We'd still be sitting in those ashes and dust, scraping bowls. Still be. 
Well, the Bible says God said, you go to Job and I've accepted him and I want him to pray for you. I just read it this afternoon. If I turn over there, I'll get bogged down. It's in Job 42. You can read it when you get home. Verse eight, God told Job's friends, go to Job. He would pray for them. Guess what it says in verse 10? God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Job, you said you've humbled yourself. Job, you said you, you said you want to get right. You said you want to repent. You said, you said you want to take it up a notch. Let's see how serious you are. I want you to pray for these three knuckleheads that's made your life miserable for the last 40 chapters. Go ahead and pray for them. Job started praying for them. What you can't do, you can't do till you forgive them. Let's just go ahead and get, you can't pray for people and really mean it and have all in your heart toward them at the same time. And I'm not talking about Lord kill them kind of praying. I'm talking about Lord bless them kind of praying. Hey, I've prayed a few of them. Lord, would you do us all a favor and would you just... It ain't gotta hurt, but could you just get rid of them, please? Like one of those vapor guns you see in the cartoons, just... Here one second, go on the next. Lord, could you please? No, 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 I'm not talking about that kind of praying. Preacher, I've been praying for my husband. You're wrong kind of praying. <laughs> Slipping arsenic in his biscuits at the same time. <laughs> I know because I've been there. I've had people in my life that made my life a living hell. And it was killing me. It had gotten in my soul. It got way down deep in there like a rotten apple. And I said, Lord, I can't take it no more. I don't like feeling this way. I don't like trying to preach and witness and sing and testify and pray with this big, gnarly, nasty gunk of junk in my soul. You gotta help me. Amen. And God showed me Job 42 and said, all right, let's see how serious you are. And I said, Lord, if you'll help me. And I'm telling you, I can remember the place where I bowed and prayed for a man that had made my life absolutely miserable. And with God's help, and only God can do this, I prayed for God to bless him and his wife and his kids and to pour out his spirit on him and use him. I prayed that, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Lord, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna have to assume he didn't even know what he was doing and they didn't mean to, and I forgive him, and I'm gonna tell you something, that day God took like a thousand pounds off of me. Am I spiritual? Not really, but I do wanna get a prayer through. And you can't get a prayer through. In fact, the Bible says, you can't even pray and ask God to forgive you if you won't forgive each other. And we know that the first thing you need to do when you pray every time is ask God to forgive you. If we confess our sins, it's faithful and just forgive us our sins because it's small and righteous. Forgive us this day our daily bread. It goes on down through there and talks about forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. You've got to get right with God. Well, you can't even get forgiveness if you won't forgive other people. That's a prayer problem. Forgiveness, unforgiveness. Does it mean that they've got to be your best friend? No. Does that mean y'all got to call each other on the phone every day? No. You ready for this? You ain't even got to friend them on Facebook. In fact, some people, the only way you can be friends with them is not friend them on Facebook. Amen. Not know what they're doing. Boy, the world's hijacked all this following, friend, and jump. It's so crazy. I'm not saying you got to be best buddies, but I'm telling you this. You're going to have to have a clear heart. I'm going I'm to go out on a limb. I'm going to say something here. Some of y'all is going to like this, and some of y'all ain't going to understand it. I'm not talking about that person's definition of forgiveness. I'm just talking about where it's not all in your heart. Well, I don't think you really forgive me because, because no, that ain't how this works. There's no awe in my heart now. And I don't want there to be awe in your heart toward me. And you can't control what they do or don't do. 
but you can do everything you can to try so that when you get down to pray, you're not a hypocrite. It's a prayer problem. Unforgiveness is a prayer problem. I wonder this evening with heads bowed and eyes closed, altars open, might be somebody to slip down here for just a few minutes and talk to God. Maybe you've struggled in your prayer life because you've got animosity, bitterness. You've got alt. That's just what the Bible calls it, alt. That word means anything, anything in your heart.